So hydrogen fusion is what powers our sun. And at the very core of our sun, it is so hot that the vast majority of the atoms, which are hydrogen one, namely atoms that have just one proton, that's why they have the mass number one. Most hydrogen atoms don't have any neutrons in the nucleus. But <clears throat> these protons essentially are naked because the temperature is so extreme that any electron associated with a proton has sufficient energy to leave the atom. So at the core of our star, we essentially have very hot, compressed protons. Now, despite the fact that they are very close to one another and very hot, it's very difficult for two protons to fuse because, of course, they're both positively charged, so there is tremendous electromagnetic repulsion between them. As a matter of fact, that repulsion is so great that if the two protons did approach one another, say this way and this way, they would deflect off in other directions and never be able to fuse. So what allows protons to fuse and how do we overcome this electromagnetic repulsion? Well, uh, there is a fourth major force in the universe that's known as the strong nuclear force. And it is the force that actually binds nuclei together. And so if we wanted to fuse these protons into a nucleus, it would be this force that does the binding. But there's a small problem. Despite the incredible strength of this force, it's only strong over a distance of 10 to the negative 15th meters, which is an extremely short distance. So if these protons approach each other, their repulsion is sufficient to prevent them ever getting this close together and preventing the strong nuclear force from binding them together. And so the question is just how is it accomplished? Well, it's accomplished by tremendous velocities. The faster these things are moving, the less able they are to uh, avoid each other, essentially, even though they're repelling. And so we need incredibly high speeds for them to be able to fuse. And you may ask, well, how's that accomplished? Well, essentially temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy of the particles. And of course, you can find by using 1 half mv squared the amount of kinetic energy. Now, if we start to heat something up, the mass doesn't change. However, the speed does increase. So as something gets a higher and higher temperature, the velocity of its particles is essentially increasing. Now, if we can heat up to roughly, oh, a nice cool 10 million kelvins of temperature, the particles are moving so fast that literally if two protons approach one another now at that high rate of speed, their repulsions are not enough to overcome the collision, and they get and close within the distance needed to affect a strong nuclear force, and bam, they fuse together. But interestingly enough, that fusion leaves only one proton of the two. The other is actually a neutron. So we haven't created helium yet. What we have created is hydrogen 2. Now, if this were an atom with its electron, it would be called deuterium. That's just the common name, deuterium, of hydrogen 2. And because this nucleus is also missing its electron, we refer to these as deuterons. Hydrogen 2 nucleus is a deuteron, just as a hydrogen 1 nucleus is a proton. Now, this collision, you may be wondering, well, what happened to the positive charge? After all, a neutron is roughly the same size as a proton, but what happened to the charge? Well, two other things are released in this collision. One of them is a tiny 
practically massless particle called a neutrino. And it zips away and can pass through almost anything. It could pass through mile after mile after mile after mile of the densest material you could imagine. And it does so at the speed of light. Very difficult to stop a neutrino. But more importantly, this collision also produces a positron. And a positron looks, walks, quacks, talks just like its counterpart, an electron. It is the same size as an electron. It is the same mass as an electron, very small, very tiny bit of mass. The only difference is they have opposing charges. And as a consequence, we'd refer to the positron as antimatter. Sorry about that, brief interruption. And you may be saying, so what? We got nice little positrons now. But essentially, this is where the energy that powers the sun comes from. Because if a positron collides with an electron, of course, nothing would repel them. They have opposite charge. They attract. They literally collide and annihilate one another and disappear. And you may be saying, that's not possible. You can't create and destroy matter. And we just destroyed a little bit of matter, a tiny bit of mass. But in fact, Einstein showed us that in fact, the only thing that's conserved in the universe is energy and matter collectively. Consequently, if we destroy a tiny bit of matter, we create energy. And of course, if C is the speed of light being squared, even a small amount of mass being essentially converted into energy creates a significant amount of energy. And this collision between positron and electron produces a photon a very high energy gamma radiation. And of course, gamma radiation is the most frequent and shortest wavelength of any sort of electromagnetic radiation. And this is the energy, essentially, that is powering the sun. It comes from this initial fusion. But the process is not over yet, because we know that Helium-4 is produced, ultimately, through this solar fusion process. And so there are additional steps. One of them is that now this deuteron can collide with another deuteron. So we have, essentially, four nuclear particles colliding. And when that happens, they approach each other at such a high rate because of the temperature at the center of the sun, that they overcome the distance needed and repulsion for the strong nuclear force to take over, and they fuse. And they form a helium-3 isotope. This, of course, is helium because there are two protons now in our nucleon. And that makes it helium because helium is atomic number two. It's helium-3 because there's also a neutron. And you may be asking yourself, well, didn't four nuclear particles collide? Yes, they did. And this process releases one of the neutrons. And we end up with a helium-3 nucleon. Now, another helium nucle excuse me, helium-3 nucleon can collide with this helium-3 nucleon. And you need even higher temperatures for these to be able to collide. Because after all, now we have a positive 2 charge in this nucleon and a plus 2 charge in this nucleon. And the larger charges will result in greater repulsion between them as they approach. So we need even hotter temperatures in the core of the sun if any further fusion is going to occur. And yes, our sun is in excess of or expected to be in excess of 15 million kelvins at its core. And so consequently, at temperatures that high, these nucleons can collide and overcome the small distance needed for the strong nuclear force to take over. And yes, 
we get a new nucleon. And this is, in fact, the helium-4 nucleus. And again, we have a little bit of accounting to do in terms of the number of nucleons, because we had three nucleons in this helium-3, and three nucleons in this helium-3, and we only have four in a helium-4 atom. And you may be saying, well, what happened to the two protons that are unaccounted for? Well, they get released in this final fusion and can go on to collide further and form other deuterons. And those deuterons can collide with other deuterons and form more helium-3. And those helium-3 atoms can collide and form more helium-4. But ultimately, the power of the sun comes not from the fusion of the helium-3s with one another. It comes from the fusion of the protons forming deuterium. And the deuteron itself, in being formed, releases a positron. And that bit of antimatter annihilates an electron. And that's where we get significant amounts of energy produced by the sun. So if we had to do some overall accounting here, it takes three, or excuse me, two helium-3 nuclei to form a helium-4. And to form one of these two helium-3s, you need two deuterons. So if we need two protons to form one deuteron, that sounds like we need eight protons to initiate the process. Because if we had eight protons, we could form four deuterons. And if we had four deuterons, we could form two helium-3 nuclei. And with two helium-3 nuclei, of course, that's how we get a helium-4 atom. And in the process, however, we do produce a couple of neutrinos. And that's because every two of these colliding produce a neutrino. So that means we're going to get four neutrinos in the process as well. And we're going to get four photons of gamma radiation. And don't forget, when these two helium-3s collide, we get out two neutrons in the process. And at long last, in the final collision, you also release two protons. So net-net, if we release two protons but consume eight for the entire process, six protons are consumed total. And therefore, this well summarizes how the sun is powered.